Um, yesterday, right? Took them to school. And Patrick ended up showing Mr. Johnson. And Omri was so disgusted with him, but then in the end, Patrick saved Omri from getting in trouble at Yap's store. So now they're together again. Omri's brothers were already sitting at the tea table when the two boys rushed in. Hi, what's for tea? Omri asked automatically. Gillen and Adiel didn't answer. Adiel had a funny smirk on his face, and Omri hardly noticed. Let's make a sandwich and eat it upstairs, he suggested to Patrick. They slapped some peanut butter on bread, poured mugs of milk, and hurried up the stairs to Omri's room, whispering all the way. How long does it take? Only a few minutes. Can I see her? Wait till we get upstairs. Remember who they found? A wife for a little bear? Omri opened the door and stopped dead. The white medicine cupboard was gone. W w where is it? gasped Patrick. Omri didn't say a word. He turned and rushed downstairs again with Patrick behind him. Okay, where have you hidden it? He shouted as soon as he burst into the kitchen. I don't know what you're referring to, said Adiel loftily. Yes, you do. You've taken my cupboard. And suppose and I did. It was only to teach you a lesson. You're always taking my things and hiding them, and now you'll see how funny it isn't. When did I last take anything of yours? Tell me one thing in the last month. My football shorts, said Adiel promptly. I never touched your stupid shorts. I already swore I hadn't. I had to miss games today because I didn't have them, and I got a detention for it, and you can be grateful I'm only punishing you for tit for tat and not bashing you in, said Adiel with a maddening calm. Ami felt so furious he even wondered for a moment whether it was worth bashing Adiel in. But Adiel was enormous, and it was helpless, and it was hopeless. And so after gazing at him for another moment with hate-filled eyes, Ami turned and dashed upstairs again, almost falling over Patrick on the way. What do you do? Look for it, of course. He was turning Adiel's room upside down like a madman when Adiel, slowly mounting the stairs in the direction of his homework, heard the racket and came running. He stood in the doorway looking at the shambles of pulled-out drawers, to gutted cupboards, and furniture pulled awry. You little swine, he howled and died at Omri, and Omri fell to the ground with Adiel on top. I'll tear everything you've got to pieces till you give it back to me, Omri shouted in jerks as Adiel shook and pummeled him. Then cough up my shorts. I don't have your stinking shorts, screamed Omri. Are these them? said a small voice in the background. Adiel and Omri stopped fighting, and Adiel, sitting astride, twisted his neck to see, and Patrick was just lifting a crumpled navy blue object from behind a radiator. Omri felt the anger go out of Adiel. Oh, yeah, as a matter of fact it is. How'd they get there? But Omri knew perfectly well how. Adiel had hung them there to dry and they dropped off backwards. Adiel scrambled up looking distinctively sheepish. He even helped Omri to his feet. Well, but you have hidden things in the past, he mumbled. How was I to know? Can I have my cupboard now? Yeah, it's up in the attic. I piled a whole lot of stuff on it. Omri and Patrick took the stairs to the attic two at a time. They found the cupboard quite quickly under a heap of bits and pieces, but Omri had carried it down to his room again before he made the fatal discovery. The key. The little twisted key with its red satin ribbon was missing. Once again, Omri ran to Adiel's room to find Adiel uncomplainingly putting things straight. What happened to the key? What key? There was a key in the cupboard door with a red ribbon. Oh, I didn't notice. They went out and closed the door, and Omri was now feeling desperate. We've got to find it. It doesn't work without the key. They searched the attic till supper time. Never had Omri so clearly seen the point of all his mother's urgings to keep everything in its proper place. The attic was just a sort of a glory hole where they could play and leave a total mess, and that was what they always did, only clearing spaces when they needed them for a new layout or for some special game, and their way of clearing was just to shove things aside into more chaotic heaps. So his attic upstairs is where they play, and they found the cupboard, but where's that key? Because the magic does not work without the key. And they're supposed to be bringing back a wife for a little bit, remember? Underneath the heaps were all the myriad little oddments that were small enough to filter through the bigger things. Marbles, wheels of matchbox cars, bits of Lego, small tools, parachute men, cards, and so on and so on, and plus all sorts of fragments that could have been almost anything. But first they just raked through everything, but after a while Omri realized that they would have to clear up systematically. Otherwise it was like the old saying about looking for a needle in a haystack. He found some boxes and they began sorting things into them. Legos here, parts of games there, water pistols, tricks and novelties in another. Bigger things they stacked neatly into what his father rather call, 
called the shelves provided, which normally stood empty since everything was on the floor. In an amazingly short time, the floor was clear except for a few odd things they hadn't found homes for, and a great deal of mud, dust, and sand. Where'd all this mud, dust, and sand come from, said Patrick. Oh, Gillen brought up boxes of it from the garden to make a desert scene, said Ami. Months ago, we might as well sweep it up. He looked around, and despite his anxiety about the key, he felt a certain pride. The room looked entirely different now. There was a real playing space now. He went downstairs and fetched a broom and a dustpan and a soft brush. We're going to have to do this carefully, he said. It would be terrible if we threw it away with the sand. We could sieve it, said Patrick. That's a good idea in the garden. Sieve, sieve, S-I-E-V-E, or sieve, sieve, is sort of like, have you ever made noodles in your kitchen? And when the noodles are done, you pour them in a colander, they call it, and all the water pours out and the noodles stay in the bowl. Well, that's what a sieve is. You would take it outside and you would maybe put dirt in it and all the dirt would fall through and then he maybe could find the key if it was in there somewhere. They carried the sand out in a cardboard box and Ami borrowed his father's large garden sieve and Ami held it and Patrick spooned in, in the sand and earth with a trowel. Several small treasures came to light, such as a 10 pence piece, but no key. Ami was in despair. He and Patrick sat down on the lawn under a tree and Ami took the two men out of his pocket. We're a woman, Little Bear said instantly. Never mind the women, where's the vittles? That'd be food, asked the ever hungry Boone grumpily. Ami and Patrick fed them some more chocolate and with a deep sense of misery, Ami produced the plastic Indian woman from his pocket. Little Bear stopped chewing his chocolate the moment he saw her and gazed in rapture. It was obvious he was half in love with her already. He reached out a hand and tenderly touched her plastic hair. Make real now, he breathed. I can't, said Ami. Why can't, said Little Bear sharply. The magic's gone. Now Boone stopped eating too, and he and Little Bear exchanged a frightened look. You mean you can't send us back, said Boone in an awestruck and whisper. Never? We gotta live in this giant's world forever? It was clear that Little Bear had been explaining matters. Well, don't you like being with us, asked Patrick. Well, I wouldn't want to hurt your feelings none, said Boone, but just think how you'd feel if I was as big as you are to me. Little Bear, said Ami. Little Bear dragged his eyes away from the plastic figure and fixed them like little bright crumbs of black glass on Ami. Ami good, he pronounced at last, but Little Bear Indian brave, Indian chief, how be brave, how be chief with no other Indians. Ami opened his mouth. If he had not lost the key, he might have rashly offered to bring to life an entire tribe of Indians simply to keep Little Bear contented. Through his mind flashed the knowledge of what this meant. It wasn't the fun, the novelty, the magic that mattered anymore. What mattered was that Little Bear should be happy, and for that he would take on almost anything. They all sat quietly on the lawn. There seemed nothing more to say. A movement near the back of the house caught Omri's eye. It was his mother coming out to hang up some wet clothes. He thought she moved like she was tired and fed up, and she stood for a moment on the back balcony looking at the sky, and then she sighed and began pegging the clothes in the line. And on impulse, Omri got up and went over to her. You haven't found anything of mine, have you? he asked. No, I don't think so. What have you lost? But Omri was too ashamed to admit he'd lost the key she'd told him to be so careful of. Oh, nothing much, he said. He went back to Patrick, who was showing the men an ant. Boone was trying to pat his head, but it wasn't very responsive. Well, Ami said, we might as well make the best of things. Um, why not bring the horses out and give the fellows a ride? This cheered everyone up. And Ami ran up and brought the two horses down carefully in an empty box. Next, Patrick stamped about two square feet of the lawn hard to give the horses a really good gallop. Quite a large black beetle alighted on the flattened part, and Little Bear shot it dead with an arrow. This cheered him up a bit more, although not much. And while the horses grazed the fresh grass, he kept giving great lovesick sighs. <sighs> and Ami knew he was thinking of the woman. Maybe you'd rather not stay the night now, Ami said to Patrick. I want to, said Patrick, if you don't mind. Ami felt too upset to care one way or another. And when they were all called in to supper, he noticed that Adiel was trying to be friendly, but Ami wouldn't speak to him. And afterwards, Adiel took him aside. What's up with you now? I'm trying to be nice. You got your silly old cupboard back. Yeah, but it's no good without the key. Well, I'm sorry. I, I must have dropped on the way up to the attic. On the way up to the attic? Ami hadn't thought of that. Will you help me find it? He asked eagerly. Please, it is terribly important. 
Oh, all right, then. The four of them hunted for half an hour, and they didn't find it. And after that, Gillen and Adiel had to go out to some function at school. So Patrick and Omri had the television to themselves. They took out the two men and explained this new magic. And then they all watched together. So just imagine Boone watching TV, right? He would have never had it in the 1800s. And Little Bear, oh my goodness, never would have had it. So they wouldn't really understand the concept that people are acting inside the TV. That would be pretty confusing for them. First came a movie about animals, which absolutely transfixed both the little men, and then a Western movie came on. Western, so like Cowboys and Indians. Does that sound like a good thing for them to watch or not? Omri thought they ought to switch it off, but Boone in particular set up such a hullabaloo that eventually Omri said, all right, just for 10 minutes then. Little Bear was seated cross-legged on Omri's knee, while Boone, who had somehow gravitated back to Patrick, preferred to stand in his breast pocket. Leaning his elbows along the pocket top with his hat on the back of his head, chewing a lump of tobacco he had on him. Patrick, who'd heard something of Cowboy's habit, said, Don't you dare spit. There's no spittoons here, you know. Let me listen to him talk, and William said, Boone, and just, I just can't get over the way they talk on that box. Before the ten minutes was up, the Indians in the movie started to get the worst of it. It was the usual sequence in which the pioneers' wagons are drawn into a circle, and the Indians are galloping around them while the outnumbered men of the wagon train fire muzzle-looking guns at them through the wagon wheels. Omri could sense Little Bear was getting restive and tense. As brave after brave bit the dust, he suddenly leaped to his feet. No good pictures, he shouted. What you talking about, Injun? Boone said, tauntingly from the chasm, dividing him from Little Bear. That's how it was. My ma and my pa was in a fight like that. And my pa told me he done near shot nearly 15 or 20 of them dirty savages. White men move on to land, use water, kill animals. So what? Let the best man win and we won. Yippee! He added as another television Indian went down with his horse on top of him. Omri was looking at the screen when it happened. In a lull of the soundtrack, he heard a thin, faint whistling sound. And he heard Boone grunt. He looked back at Boone swiftly, and his blood froze. The cowboy had an arrow sticking out of his chest. I want you to look at this carefully. So there they are watching TV. And you can see, right, that you can see that Boone's up here watching the, the movie, and he's kind of giving Little Bear a hard time. He's in the pocket of Omri's shirt. And down, do you see where Little Bear is? And do you see what Little Bear has in his arm? his bow. So he got so upset about what he saw on TV, thinking it was probably real, he just shot an arrow into Boone. Oh boy. Crazy. For a couple of seconds, Boone remained upright in Patrick's breast pocket. And then quite slowly, he fell forward. Omri had often marveled at the way people in films, particularly girls and women, were given to letting out loud screams of, at dramatic or awful moments. And now he felt one rise in his own throat, and he would have let it out if Little Bear had not cried out first. Patrick, who had not noticed anything amiss until now, looked at Little Bear, saw where his bow arm was still pointing, and then he looked down at his own pocket. Over the top of it, Boone hung, head down, as limp as a piece of knotted string. Boone, Boone, no, snapped Omri. Don't touch him. Ignoring Little Bear, who tumbled down his trouser leg to the floor as he moved, Omri very carefully lifted Boone clear between finger and thumb and laid him across the palm of his hand. And the cowboy lay face up with the arrow still sticking out of his chest. Is he dead? whispered Patrick in horror. I don't know. Sh shouldn't we take the arrow out? He can't. Little Bear must. With infinite care and slowness, Omri laid his hand on the carpet, and Boone lay perfectly still. With such a tiny body, it was impossible to be sure whether the arrow was stuck in where his heart is or a little higher up in his shoulder. The arrow shaft was so fine you could only just make it out by the minute cluster of feathers. Little Bear, come here. Omri's voice was steely, a voice Mr. Johnson himself might have envied. It commanded obedience. Little Bear, scrambling to his feet after his fall, walked unsteadily on to Omri's hand. Get up there and see if you've killed him. Without a word, Little Bear climbed onto the edge of Omri's hand and knelt down beside the prostrate Boone. 
He laid his ear against his chest just below the arrow. He listened, then straightened up, but without looking at either of the boys. Not killed, he said sullenly. Ami felt his breath go out in relief. Take the arrow out carefully. If he dies now, it will be double your fault. Little Bear put one hand on Boone's chest with his fingers on either side of the arrow and with the other took hold of the shaft where it went into Boone's body. So he's lucky because if it had it been in his heart, he would have died immediately. So it must be up a little higher. It was just very hard for them to be able to tell where it is. Little Bear put one hand there and then he said, blood will come, need stop up hole. Well, Amri's mother kept boxes of tissues in every room, mainly so no one would have an excuse to sit and sniff, and Patrick jumped up and brought this, tearing off a tiny corner and rolling it into a wad no bigger than a pinhead. Now it's got germs from your hand, said Amri. Where's the disinfectant? In the bathroom cupboard. Do not let my mom see you. While Patrick was gone, Amri sat motionless and silent, his eyes fixed on Little Bear, still poised to pull out the arrow. And after a long minute... The Indian muttered something, and in Amri bent his head low. What? Little Bear, sorry. Amri straightened up, his heart cold and untouched. You'll be a lot sorrier if you don't save him, was all he said. Sometimes sorry just isn't enough, is it? And in this case, it is not enough. Patrick raised back with a bottle of Listerine. He poured a drop into the lid and dipped the little ball of tissue into it. Then he held the cap closer to Little, little Bear. Go on, Ami ordered. Pull it out. Little Bear seemed to brace himself, and then he began to tremble. Little Bear not do. Little Bear not doctor. Get doctor back. He know make how make wound good. We can't, said Ami shortly. The magic's gone. You must do it. Do it now. Now, Little Bear. Again, the Indian stiffened, and closing his hand tightly around the arrow, he slowly and steadily drew it out and threw it aside. And then, as the blood welled up over Boone's checked shirt, Little Bear swiftly squeezed the liquid out of the ball of tissue and pressed it against the wound. Use your knife now. Cut the dirty shirt away. Without hesitating, Little Bear obeyed. Boone lay still, and his face was under its tan, was turning ashy gray. We need a bandage, said Patrick. There's nothing we could use, and we can't move him to wrap it up, and we'll have to use a tiny bit of Band-Aid. Again, Patrick went to the bathroom, and again, Ami, Little Bear, and Boone were left alone. Little Bear knelt now with his hands loose on his thighs, his head down. His shoulders rose and fell once. Was he sobbing with shame or fear, or could it be sorrow? Patrick returned with a box of Band-Aids and a pair of nail scissors, and he cut out a big square, big enough to cover the whole of Boone's chest. And Little Bear stuck it on with great care and even, Ami thought, tenderness. Now, said Ami, take off your chief's cloak and cover him up warmly. This too Little Bear did uncomplainingly. We'll take him upstairs and put him to bed, said Amri. Oh, God, I wish we had that key and I could use that and I could get that doctor back. As they walked slowly upstairs, he told Patrick about the First World War soldier, Tommy, that he had brought to life to tend to Little Bear's leg wound. We've got to find that key, said Patrick. We've just got to. Little Bear, still at Boone's side as a, on Amri's hand, said nothing. In Amri's room, Patrick made a bed for the cowboy from a folded handkerchief and another woolen square cut from Amri's sweater. Ami slipped a bit of thin, stiff card between Boone and his own hand, and on this he transferred the wounded man without too much disturbance, which might have started the bleeding again. He was still unconscious. Little Bear silently stood by. Suddenly he moved. Reaching up, he snatched off his chief's headdress, and he threw it violently onto the ground. And before Ami could stop him, he began jumping on it, and in a second or two, all the beautiful tall turkey feathers were bent and broken. Leaving it lying there, Little Bear took off across the carpet, running as hard as he could over the deep woolen tufts, stumbling sometimes, but running always in the direction of the seed box and his home. Patrick moved, but Amri said quietly, leave him alone. So he's feeling terrible about what he did, but this is one of those mistakes, or maybe it wasn't really a mistake, but something he did out of anger that could have killed someone. So he certainly feels terrible about, terrible about it, and he should.